The boroughs are New York City. The burbs are everywhere else. Real estate is the ultimate game of risk and reward. It's the biggest investment most people ever make. Fortunes are made over a lifetime and lost in a day. And we're not playing with Monopoly money. How do you stay ahead? Who's buying? Who's selling? And why? What do they know? We want the truth. You need an edge. Burrows and Burbs is your secret weapon, giving you the insider knowledge and strategies you need to succeed in the high-stakes world of real estate. From Palm Beach to Palm Springs, Manhattan to Malibu, we press the experts to expose the pain, find the deals, and occasionally predict the future. That's Burrows and Burbs, Thursdays, 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. Because everyone can make money in real estate. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, Season 4, Episode 157. We're in Year 4. I am your host, John Engel, and I'm joined by my co-host. I'm Roberto Cabrera. I'm on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Welcome, and I'm in And I'm in Connecticut, center of the known universe. <laughs> unless, you're, unless you're a New Yorker. Uh, today, we have two very special guests, Bob Bakes of Bakes and Crop Fine Cabinetry and Eric Chores from Faithful Countertops. Um, we're going to do, does the kitchen make the home? An idea brought to us by Lisa Ben Isvi. I'm going to pull up uh, her website and let's see, introduce her properly. Uh, Lisa is the most connected person I know in New York City in the design community. Goes way back with these gentlemen, back to designing spaces. And uh, so, Lisa, tell us about the inspiration for the show. Well, I truly believe, which they're going to share, that a kitchen does make the home. And since Bob of Bob Banks makes the most gorgeous kitchens there are, and Eric is a fabricator and has every possible countertop material and knows all the quality and Quality means nothing without the finest insulation. So I thought no better than to put these two together and share with us. Excellent. And so why don't you tell us about, uh, well, okay, Bob, welcome to the show. I'm going to pull up your Great to be page. here. Thank you for having me on the thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to have you. I thought you were just a local kitchen designer. I'm looking at your website. And I'm noticing that you're rather national. Here it is, boom. You've got showrooms in New York, the Hamptons, Long Island, Palm Beach, Plymouth, Michigan, and Bay Harbor, Michigan. You got a few more states to go, but I still consider that pretty national. <laughs> yeah, we've only just started. Okay. And, and uh, Eric, I see you are also uh, all, all over the world, right? Uh, Lido Beach, New York, New York City, the suburbs. Yeah, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Faithful Countertops? Oh, uh, so we are based in New Jersey. We cover, um, you know, tri-state area mostly, uh, but we do ship a lot of stuff uh, through our entire country and, you know, and, and overseas. So, yeah, we specialize in the, in the um, uh, you know, custom fabrication and the multi multi <laughs> Uh, projects and you know it's a it's a family business you know came, family came. business based in new jersey and and covering the tri-state area or east coast or I mean, we, we'll cover the the you know installation we cover in tri-state area the the fabrication and, and 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 shipping products we cover mostly all over the world so we send that away so you're fabricating really? the stone the cabinets no, we're, we're fabricating the stone. We're fabricating the uh, the the natural, mostly natural stone and quartzes and porcelain. You know, the solid surface. Uh, uh, you know, basically everything that you can put in any kitchen or any 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 room in in, in a house. Okay. So I love doing the kitchen show. The first time in season one, I think it was Roberto. We did a kitchen show and we had a kitchen designer on, and he sort of sensitized us to the fact that I think it was probably back in the 80s 
uh, we didn't think about kitchens the way we do now. The kitchen was full of dark brown furniture. And that was really the beginning of the white kitchen and what I'd consider the modern but kitchen. It was, but it was also a space that was in some ways relegated to you go in to do what you need to do in the kitchen and you come out. It was workspace. Yeah, it was workspace. Now, the way we live, it's become part, you know, it's, it's this, the way we live. It's come on over. Let's all cook dinner. Let's all, you know, spend time in the kitchen. So the usage uh, has completely changed. Yeah, so I wanted to really talk about the evolution of that. I mean, it's been evolving probably since the 80s as the kitchen is so much more than a workspace. It's an entertainment space. It's a gathering space. It's the heart of the home. And so I really want to get at this question of trends. Is the trends evolving further still? Are we bringing TVs and living rooms and sofas into our kitchen? Is the kitchen really become an all-encompassing or... Are we moving in the other direction where it's becoming increasingly specialized with specialized kick kitchen uh, technology? Uh, so let's talk about the overarching trends, Bob. I think this is a great point that you bring up. It's an interesting sort of segment, which I've offered before in conversations like this, the development of kitchens. And obviously we deal in the luxury high end, ultra luxury uh, position in the marketplace. I position the company there purely so the people who have a target for that kind of essence when it comes down to the design of their kitchens. And we don't just, we don't talk about cabinetry so much. We talk about the kitchen as a piece. We're trying to create a kitchen as a, as a piece of art. Sounds a bit sort of fancy, but really that's, I think sometimes we achieve that. It's to see some of the stuff that we do and to feel that it is artful brings me an awful lot of, um, it brings an awful lot of juice to what I do. Um, if we go back into, we go back into, I'm obviously from England, right? And um, going back into the early 70s, there's a fellow called Smallbones. Uh -huh. right? His name was Charlie Smallbone. And there was another guy called Mark Wilkinson. They're sort of known to be, um, at least in the UK, and they, they did spread further afield as the years went on, but they initiated it where they started the concept of the luxury kitchen design styling. They had something called the unfitted kitchen, which was component parts of activity. So it had storage, preparation, cooking. I mean, that's expanded over the years. But in essence, there was those three initial segments which formed the working triangle, which they took and they developed it. And they, they developed a style and a concept where kitchens became luxurious, not just places for activity centers. So that's, so that's been developed. And from, from knowing that chef to moving through to my initial entry into the, U, into the US about 20 years ago, I worked for somebody who had worked for Charlie Smallbone back in the day, and he'd set up his own company. And then I set up Bakes in 2006, and that transversed into Bakes and Crop in 2014. So there's been this sort of linear de development of style and concept, but it's, it's based on that depth of luxury that was brought forward in the early 70s. And I, I mean, I sort of vaguely remember that time frame. I wasn't involved in kitchens at the time. It was not until probably the, the 90s that I became involved in it back wow. in the UK. But there's been this development. And, and you can see from, from our website, if you flick into the website and go into the inspiration page, and I think um, John can flag that up. If you just go into inspiration mm -hmm. and portfolio, click on that. Now, every single one of these images was based on the development from what you mentioned, John, is the, the classic white kitchen. When the white kitchen came out in the United States in the early 90s, it was a development from a company called Peacock Cabinetry. And they basically coined the white kitchen, which was an inset scullery style kitchen. And the development of that came from the small bones type of thing. So I keep on referring back to it, but it's, it's that sort of, regal linear linear connection between those per people and that company and there's essences of that original white kitchen if you look at sort of elegant gallery on the right hand side you can see where the white kitchen has been taken to a different level with some accent 
and emphasis. And if you scroll down a little bit further, one of my favorites is the Ocean Road Elegance. That takes a white kitchen and it adds elements of, well, you see the hood is obviously a fancy piece, but it's just two components. It's a walnut stain. We actually ceruse it. One of the few people that do ceruse walnut. It's a very tricky one to do well because there's no depth of grain in it. So without getting technical, um, you have it's a subtlety, a subtle presentation of the walnut. But if there's a classic BK kitchen that presents itself to the market, perhaps Ocean Road Elegance might be that conceptual piece that if somebody, say you came to me and you said, well, what, what, what is the classic BK kitchen? Well, this is kind of where you might start. And then it can develop from there. But if we've taken the white kitchen with a twist and we've given it another twist and another twist, and we, we've continued to development uh, the development of colors, stains, and finishes. But for me, it's it, got to it be looks to me like design. elegant. The elegant galley looks like a New York kitchen to me, yeah. and the mere you uh, the elaborate use of space in Ocean Road Elegance tells me that that's a house in the country. Is that fair? It's in, it's in Bridgehampton in the Hamptons, right? Okay. So one of our locations is in the Hamptons. So. The development of kitchens and spaces in the Hamptons is quite different from the development in New York City, purely down to the spacialness that you have in those kitchens. Yeah, I could land an airplane on on that yeah, island in Ocean Road Elegance. Yeah, I mean, you might, yeah, land a chopper on the island, but an airplane might be a struggle. But yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it is it has quite a piece and a beautiful house, and ten thousand square feet. Obviously, apartments in New York City are very rarely that size, although we do a very, very occasionally get them. But yeah, there's been that development for subtle in, in, injections of color and texture. And for me, it's always got to be subtly balanced. I've got to have connection points. If I'm going to stick a bit of blue in somewhere, I want a blue to pop somewhere else, just so that there's a relationship between those two pieces and it doesn't look like an isolated event. So there's got to be those little bits of connection but for certain, we we encourage our clients to explore a little bit more than perhaps they might have done previously. Um, so what's the challenge? Them. What's the challenge in a New York kitchen? It occurs to me that New Yorkers are so uh, where space is at such a premium, and you're showing us a galley kitchen in New York. I would imagine that your value add is in a great deal. Uh, and being able to say, I'm going to organize your kitchen to do more in less space. Right. Thoughtful design, really thoughtful design. If you go to a kitchen design company that has a depth of experience like us, like there are a number of other companies that create themselves in the same sort of way, we try and concentrate and focus on what is the, what's the logistics, what's the movement of the kitchen, how's it going to work? before we start layering in what it's going to look like. So from when I'm teaching people design kitchens from the get-go, <clears throat> we speak about the logistic, the movement centers, the places of activity, cooking, preparation, storage, coffee center, desk, um, microwaving, dishwashers. So that triangle has already expanded to five, six or seven different activities already and put them into a small- Are, are you telling me the triangle of 1980 is now the octagon of 2024? Because right, I've got two dishwashers, yeah. I got a, I got to have a prep sink. I mean, I'm in Connecticut after all. I got right, a nine right. foot island. I got a, a main sink and a prep sink. Two dishwashers, two fridges, under cabinet fridges, bar fridge. Once I have all that, Ooh, I'm wait a minute. You, you, you might have a, you might have a desk activity center which yeah. is a congregation point. You've certainly got, if you've got a kitchen with an island, you've certainly got a congregation point in the kitchen, which you may not have had in the smaller kitchens in the past. So there's all these additional activities that are coming into the kitchen, which, yeah, have made, if it was the heart of the home before, it was the heart of the home from a creation and activity standpoint, purely to prepare and serve food and store it. Now it's... Uh, whole activity center where people are congregating to for their coffee in the morning for their drinks in the evening for the bar area it's just there's so many more things to go on into. so in, in the house design you've seen i'm sure you have to have seen in the in houses where space is typically much more ample and you have a lot more flexibility 
that because we're talking about the kitchen makes the home you have to have seen that the footprint of the kitchen has just expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded because also the the form of living is more open that you can see the kitchen and that you can hang out in the kitchen and there's a couch in the kitchen and a coffee table and all those types of things so you have to look at the holistic space but also i guess the contiguous rooms to which are attached to the kitchen as well. I mean, I was literally just with a client who has a beautiful apartment and they have, you can see from the kitchen to the living room, but it's a long shot with a long foyer in the middle. And he still has the same problem where he's like, my wife comes, she brings everybody, she cooks and she likes to be with people and talk with them in the kitchen, but we never ever get to the beautiful living room ever. So now he's literally looking at new apartments because he wants it to be much more close and much more together because he wants it to have a certain feel to it and a certain a certain usability. Um, so I have to imagine that just the design in a house has to have, all of that has to have expanded into one gigantic space. Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, there was, a, there was a time when there was the, the kitchen and kitchen and family room was an integral part of, say, a Hampton's home. I mean, that's my classic experience. Uh, now we've, I've seen there's been there's been perhaps a little bit more definition over the last few years where architects have taken that concept and they've actually opened it up into a living room as well. So you get in that three stage development where you get the kitchen, the family room, and that's really melded together. And then there's been a living room which was perhaps a separate entity before, which is now maybe they stick a fireplace between the two rooms, but you've still got the flanking openings either side, and you've seen these, so you can get a feeling of. Um, expanse when you stand at one end of the room or the other but you still don't necessarily feel you're intruding into the space but still the kitchen family room yeah it's been a big one i mean the, the footprints are large and definitely there's there's equal challenges in a big kitchen as there are in a small one the smaller ones ask us questions about how can we get as the functions that we really need to get into the space for what the client wants the bigger kitchens are how could we connect the elements so they're not too far apart physically and they still all sort of work together? So equally, small kitchens, large kitchens, they all take a lot of thought. And I think it goes to one of the questions later is um, why, how do you start with kitchen design? Well, first, we just talk with somebody like me, basically. That's what you should be doing. I've also right. seen houses where the, there's a big kitchen that's literally just a show kitchen. Because the people you come over and you're like, oh no, we don't cook here. And it's a beautiful right. kitchen. We don't cook here. We cook in that room over there. And then you go walk over and there's another kitchen. And that's actually where everything gets cooked. Yeah. Occasionally, um, I mean, there was one kitchen I actually did at an apartment or park, and it was a big one. It was on the, I think it was on the top floor, and it had the kitchen dining room connected. It was a fairly large L-shaped kitchen with an island, which is unusual in New York City. I can absolutely say without fear of contradiction the clients will never cook in that kitchen they just won't it looks gorgeous it was a piece of art like you it, was, it was a piece of art yeah it was it was all balanced and sort of symmetry with certain areas and all those things that i kind of played to and a, an island which was just so funky it was unreal um but we know from their their use of their hampton's place and so on and so on that and he might use the microwave occasionally with a coffee maker. And that's where Eric comes in and puts like the jewelry on. on the that's kitchen. what I wanted to ask Eric about. <laughs> I had the privilege of going into New York City yesterday and I got to see a couple of the super luxe apartments on Billionaire's Row. I started my day at 53 West 53rd, an element listing, and I ended my day at 520 Park Avenue a BHS listing, the penthouse, $100 million, right, for this fabulous, and it's the last unit in the building. And when I went through, I was struck by the finishes. I really wanted to know how, if you've got the most expensive real estate in New York and the most expensive real estate in the world, what finishes do you pick? And I asked her, and she said, statuary here and statuary there. Talk to me, Eric, about when you have Usually. unlimited budget and you want ultra luxury, where are we going these days? I think we're going to Italy. 
Uh, to collect all the dogs in order to play high in Miami and in putting all those dogs. Can you speak up? Uh, you're you're cutting trouble. out a bit. Well, maybe um, can you speak? Can you better? Yeah, that's better. All that's right, better. I'm going to pull up your portfolio. Tell us some of the finishes that we're looking at here. It strikes me that gray is the new white. Yeah, is that an overstatement? Oh, no, no, it's actually correct. I think the uh, new new trend is the earth colors, you know, all the blade beiges and light nude greens and, and, and you know, very light, light yeah. colors actually too, you know, there's a lot of grays and, and, and reds in, uh, in, in those colors. So yeah, this is a uh, statuary marble uh, that we put in the Manhattan uh, penthouse. Uh, How do I know that statuary? Because of that stripe? Well, yeah, grain vein that is going through the uh, the counter countertop. Yes. Okay. Very, you know, minimalistic look of that gray vein. That's that's what is, uh, you know. Um, and they're doing it on the wall too, right? All the way up the wall around, and so the fireplace around is now become an entire wall of statuary marble. Correct. I mean, now the the. Places that people put in, uh, you know, not in stone is is endless. You know, the fireplaces, the floors, countertops, uh, hoods, the wrapping, you know, kind of, you know, stone hoods, you know, uh, with the with the with the stone uh, bathrooms. I mean, endless. You can do anything with the with the with the stone at this point. You know, I think Bob can say, you know, they, they do a lot of, uh, I don't know if you, uh, you know, stone on the, on the cabinet faces right now. Uh, it's, it's very popular as well. So now here's somebody in Lido Beach who picked not stone, clearly not statuary. Talk to me about what went into this choice. It looks, is that, is it, is it fair to say synthetic? Yeah, that's a synthetic quotes. Uh, okay. that's Product is very doable. I think durable. I think it's one of the uh, most popular color. I mean, the products in, in the market right now. I mean, this is basically basically uh, picked by the um, homeowners that has a lot of going on in the kitchen, and they cook. They have a one kitchen that they spend you know most of the time with the kids. You know, it's very easy to clean, low maintenance. Um, you know, the price obviously is is as well. You know, less than marble. From you know, from you know, as a realtor, I'm not allowed to say this is good for kids, not good for kids. But it's great talking to a fabricator like yourself, who's able to say, if you've got kids, we should be looking at the synthetic quartz. <laughs> if you have a very uh, busy life and and you do a lot of stuff in the kitchen, yes, definitely, I will say a lot of finger painting going on in this kitchen, right? What is I'm sorry, I could a lot of finger painting. Yeah, a lot of exactly, exactly, a lot of finger painting, especially in the marbles. You, you know, there's a lot of maintenance in, in the product. Yeah, play doh, finger painting. You know, a lot of arts and crafts. Right. I'm not going to mess up my Danby marble, right? That's correct. That's correct. So if you if if anybody looking for the countertop, they have to answer a few questions. You know. Um, why they use it, you know, what, what, what kind of, what, what, gonna, what are they going to do in the kitchen? You know, how are they going to use it? Are they, are they looking for something that is easy to clean? Are they very, you know, uh, low maintenance people that they, you know, they don't like to clean after, you know, when you spill the, you know, the red wine on the counter, on the calacata marble, um, you know, you just have to wipe it right away. Otherwise you're going to end up with a stain. What so, is this uh, gray? I mean, since we talked about, Christopher Peacock, move over. We're not doing white anymore. Talk to me about the different kinds of grays and blacks. Is this absolute black? No. So this is the new product that is on the market. Is the uh, Dectin. Uh, this is the the um, porcelain. Um, I will say center stone. Um, it's it's a man-made product. It's very doable. I mean, it's a heat resistant, uh, very good for the kitchens, for the for the outdoor kitchens, uh, for the uh, fireplaces. Um, yeah, that's basically what the, what people are using right now. Is but this I, expensive or not expensive? It's it's in the metal range, I would mm -hmm. say. In the metal range. Does that come in different colors? That material it comes with the different colors. It's the um, they they the, the company tried to mimic the uh, the natural stone. This is something that 
a lot of people go for um, at, at the moment. You know, if they, they don't want to spend, you know, crazy amount of money for natural Calacara gold or, or statuary or any any marbles. They 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 just picked the uh, porcelain with the with the print um, of Calacara, for example. And it's very realistic. The the print is very it gets better and better every every year. You know the 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 company is innovating this and 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 you know the, it, it came out really really good. It looks like a lot more synthetic than ever before, and it doesn't sound to me like that's an economic choice. It has to do with it, it's not because I can't afford real stone. I just prefer the synthetic, the quartz. The, is that I, true? People yeah, who can afford anything are choosing synthetic. I mean, I mean a lot of people need to need to answer the question. You know how. How they're gonna use the the, the the kitchen? How they you know if they're gonna cook a lot or they don't gonna cook a lot? You know, obviously, marble is a very good product, but it's a high maintenance. You know, uh, staining, etching, sealing. You know, every every two three months, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of work to to to. It's like getting a black car. You know, you have to clean it. You have you, you see all the scratches. The same thing with the marble. So they go with the with something that is. It looks looks new all the time. You know, you don't have to worry about it, especially when you you do have a kids. You know, they, they you know how um, you have to you have to you have to run around with them and 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 clean after everything. So so that's that's they, they go the safer way. You know, spending a lot of money, you don't want to spend thousands of dollars and and end up in the stain uh, on the second day, right? So I think a lot of people try to go safe in the in this case. Eric, how often do you how, what like? measure of people what like what percentage of people come in and they really just want something almost kind of wild with a nor with tremendous color tremendous veining and and things like that and does it does it always work <laughs> no not really no no it does, it's not it's not always like 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 that but it's but it's it happens you know once a while that you know the people come in and says you know i want you know the most expensive marble and you know i, I don't really care if you're gonna have staining or not i just love the look and I, that's what i go for you know a lot of people go for the look like you know why people you know spending um on something that they know is gonna stain they're just basically they just like the look they don't like the uh the the something that is that isn't fake you know not, not, i don't want to say fake but it's 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 a mimic of the uh, of the natural stone you see that you see the difference Let's talk about the process. I want to get into uh, with Bob. My process back at uh, 15 Richmond Hill was I wa I'm a realtor, so I get to see a lot of kitchens. And I fell in love with one of these countertops. So I went back to my kitchen designer and I said, I want a white Danby marble island. And then you can build the rest of the kitchen around that. But I want a nine foot by four foot slab of Danby that looks like the water is, you know, is just, you know, uh, rolling up the beach. And uh, I built my kitchen around the island. Do does does a lot? Do a lot of people once they say this is how I use my kitchen, come to you with some design idea or some material, which is what I'm hearing from Eric. They fell in love with Picasso marble. They fell in love with Black Absolute, Danby, whatever it was. And they come to you and they say, I love this. And it's really a piece of art that you're building a kitchen around. You're on mute. <clears throat> I don't think as often as you think. It's, it's rare occasions somebody will have something that they are particularly drawn to. But it is incredibly rare. Um, if I was to try and remember somebody specifically who said, I've got this beautiful piece of marble that we used in our previous house and I absolutely want to use it again, then maybe one or two instances would come up. What we're trying to do is we're trying to balance both the aesthetic and also the function too. Um, what I have seen that Eric um, didn't mention, but there's something that I've started using a lot of the sports side, which is a, a natural material. It has a behavioral characteristics, a bit like granite. And it's got an intensity and weight um, a denseness similar to granite. 
So it has a more of a resistance to staining, but it's still natural. Uh, it's fairly, fairly expensive, but some of the, um, just some of the tones and textures and, and ports I are blowing me away these days. And I've just, we've just been renovating showrooms over the last two or three years, and I've been incorporating more natural quartzite in these new showrooms than I have in the past, simply because I feel it brings extra energy, but it's also fairly practical too. It is more practical than the softer marbles. Um, it is still a natural stone, so it is still potentially susceptible to staining, but there's some people who do want that natural feel. They feel as though they'd rather not go down the synthetic route. Um, some of the images we saw of the very thin countertops uh, with a decton, half an inch or so, um, and some of those images, they don't actually play to what Bakes and Crop is as a design style. Our design style is we, we try and stay as a company reasonably disciplined, right? I've created this imagery and I've created this concept in my company and it's based on a certain level of, well, this is what a BK kitchen is going to look like. It has an essence, it has a feel about it. I'm not going to divert to a boffy or a bull towel or an El Milmo or kind of lookalikes like that. I'm going to stay within our sort of disciplined tram lines. There's an awful lot of flexibility you can see on the website. But to stay within those tram lines, it means that I'm presenting a certain concept to a client. And generally speaking, the clients will gravitate towards our suggestions. So if I'm saying, what do you think about this quartzite? And they see it in the showroom. And almost, they're going to say, well, that's, that is really I, got, nice. I have a small you question. Mean, white and dark or whatever. That. It sort of moves from there. But we have a great starting point. It occurs to me that people of a certain age, like my age, who grew up saying, nylon polyester i'm not wearing polyester nylon i want the real stuff i'm gonna i'm a cashmere i'm a linen kind of guy and i would think that now now today's generation generations z x millennials are much more comfortable with what i'd call performance fabrics and high technology so would you say that old clients like me are say mm. give me a good piece of stone eric and it's maybe the younger generation who are more comfortable with performance fabrics and performance and tight high tech world that we live in that are are open to these suggestions i mean uh, are, is there any demographics at work here on the trend line i believe so i think it's the the younger generation is more open to innovations to new products to to stuff that it's that it's actually you know less popular than 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 you know than the natural stone right i mean you know we have designers in out of the city that they just they just love natural stone and they will never go with the with something that is may made and client old clients like me you can see that a guy wearing a bow tie it's probably not going for your quartzite, right? Yeah, could be, could be. So yeah, so a lot of people will go still, still going. So we see the trends. Uh, Manhattan, you know, uh, Long Island, it's it's mostly natural stone. Uh, a lot of quartzite, quartzite marbles, uh, travertines. Um, you know, the 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 rest of the places, you know, the the especially the younger generation, they go with the quartz and and and. And and you know like Becton's or porcelain products and stuff that is maybe less expensive, but it also looks you know decent uh, in the kitchen when it's installed. I think it's worth saying as well that there's been a fairly significant development of product in the synthetic market over the last ten years. If we look at where we were 15, 20 years ago, and what what was on offer back in those days, that people would look at and go, "Eh, looks a bit fake, doesn't it? Doesn't it?" <laughs> They would feel it. They wouldn't feel the sort of the realness of it. Nowadays, you've got some of these companies that produce this quartz material, producing absolutely superb designs, which are really acceptable in a high-end design environment too. So we as designers have got a lot more choice. So we can offer these things to our clients, whether they're old, young, medium. I can look at them and say, well, actually, I really had sort of, I thought I'd really want to have real stone, but this looks, is this real? So th there's enough um, diversion in the marketplace now that people can sort of gravitate towards the synthetics for the want of a better word. And there's stylistically, they're going to achieve some really fantastic results. And if they've got a hint towards durability, which is 
their overarching concern, then they're probably going to go down the synthetic route just because the classic classic statement would be, I love natural stone, but and that's what it is. Well, can we talk about cabinets? How do you just how do you guide people with regards to wood, you know, high gloss lacquer, back painted glass, you know, metal? Like what how do you go about that conversation? I think I'll sort of revert back to what I was saying about uh, us having created a, a style of what BK looks like as a company and what we look like as a product. So when people come to us, they have a, a sense of where we're going to be going with the design. We, we have, I suppose I would call it, I mean, everything you see here is almost exclusively either white with walnut or white with oak. And we treat the two textures, oak and walnut, with a slight sort of ceruzing, a hint of, um, it's just a, a hint of a, a stain, but it's all subtle. I'm trying to design subtle kitchens, even though sometimes they're not subtle, but we, we sort of try and keep in that um, lane of a subtle presentation so people can feel that the kitchen has a, has a warmth about it. It feels as though it's a place that you want to stay in. I've always believed that the kitchen is the heart of home and the bigger they've got, the more people congregate, the more people are going to want to stay in that space. And the more of a visually pleasing experience it is, that the kitchen is not going to have a piece which is going to jump out and grab them by the throat. It's going to have an over sort of over fit. So just the feeling of it is going to be, this is just the place I really want to hang out in. You see that bottom one with the blue, right? This one on the bottom right. Right. We sort of played around with that a bit. That was for a show house. Sometimes I get invited to do a show house kitchen and we sort of want to, give it a bit more punch than perhaps we normally would do. So here I designed a hood and we picked a blue color. Um, it's our classic insect cabinetry, but nonetheless, it had a, it's still got a lot of elements of what BK is, which is that the hardware is the hardware I designed years ago. It's got the fluted glass. It's got a lot of the pieces that you'd see in a classic BK kitchen. But in this case, we coupled it with a, a fairly strong blue, but then we infused some of the Saru's walnut into the pieces as well, which you can see if you go into the wide shot again. Click on that one. That's the one. So you can see there's a walnut countertop. This 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 was about, I think, uh, 15 feet long, the um, mm. whole island. So I wanted to use wooden stone. There's a, a trick that they use there a lot where we put a stone element in and a wood element in. Wood can be made as long as you want. And then just infuse the color and overlay it with some... Uh, stained light and walnut pieces as well. But everything you see there is either painted wood or stained walnut. So this blue, though, was your choice. This blue was your choice. Yeah, it kind of was. I, I wanted to have something a little bit stronger than we would normally do. Have you had clients through the power of suggestion of this say, you know what, I like that blue, I want blue, or I want something else? We've had more clients say, I really love what you did there, but I think it might be a bit strong for me. <laughs> okay. But you know That's what? Great. Uh, at least it at least it brings it gives us a real good talking point. And you did it because it's a show stuff. house too. That was a 2021 show house. Right. Yeah. So in a show house, you kind of do things that are a little bit outside. Sure. Yeah, just no, a little I, bit. I mean, we I do it. we do succumb to the show house yeah. thing where you want to just shout Speak, a little bit louder. Speaking of surfaces, we haven't talked about the floor. Most all of those kitchens had wood floors. Yeah. Um, do, do you do you have clients who are like, look, I want a marble floor or a you know a ceramic some sort of ceramic tiled floor or terracotta floor or anything like that? Well, you see that one on the top on the Kips Bay Palm Beach. You'll see that that actually has a tile floor. Now, the, the de definition of the space, it was in a 1930s house, um, decent sized house, but 5,000 square foot in West Palm. Uh, and so this is, but this so, is kind of but, geographically driven because in my no, opinion, no, it, no. What I was, what I was going to say was it, it was the definition of the space and the room. The room was very well defined. It was, uh, it was a three a three wall closed segment and it had a walkway into a different area which is behind us in the photograph you can't see that so it was easier for us to say okay we can define this space with a different floor covering and then when you move from the floor from the kitchen into what was then the dining room with an alcove walkthrough which was only about seven or eight yeah. feet wide then it was easy enough to visually present a saddle to the wood floor 
where the transition was comfortable. A lot of the times, as we talked about earlier, the, the size of the kitchen and the family room and the living room, it really is one contiguous space. And so to define that with the different floor covering is, is an absolute rarity in the places that we work. Sometimes in a New York City kitchen, I can see that we're gonna get a space which is well-defined with one entry, one exit, and that we can perhaps put a stone floor in there. But for the most part, people aren't asking us for stone floors in the kitchen. Roberto, That's you're sitting in the kitchen, right? You're in the well, kitchen. The kitchen's off. over there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can see it in the distance. It, it's wood, wood floor. Wood floors? Yeah. But this is, we're also, we're on, we're in the Northeast. Like I, what I find is a lot of Florida, maybe it's because of the humidity or whatever. There's a lot of, I mean, there's ceramic tile and marble floors throughout the entire home, right. which is very hard, very hard, especially if you're going to be standing up. You know, I find that that's a, that's a tough surface to be. Yeah, for sure. Up. The Florida market is different. If you've got a big five, 6,000 square foot house in Boca somewhere, it's going to almost almost certainly going to have an entirely tiled floor in it almost for sure so eric do you love that because you sell so much material do i love uh, having a marble in the kitchen on the floor i think no and especially maybe maybe in florida when you when you have 100 degrees outside maybe that's that's a good feeling to have a have a marble floor uh, but definitely not here you know i would i'll i'll, I'll prefer you know with in the kitchen <laughs> Scott Hobbs is with us. He's uh, joining us, I guess, from New York. And uh, he builds fabulous houses for the rich and famous. And when it came time to do his own house, it was the first time I had seen, is it colored concrete in the kitchen? Talk to me about why you did that. Because you've been exposed to all the best kitchens that you've been building around Fairfield County and the Hamptons and in New York. So why did you choose concrete? Oh. Uh, because my wife wanted it. That's easy. It's uh, I think she wanted something that was more under a, a um, natural type finish, but with concrete, you get something that's both man-made and yet organic looking. I mean, it's a real combination between like a natural marble and a true synthetic. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed listening in on this, and I do think that we're in a very interesting period where some of the nat there, there's unbelievable natural stuff out there and things that we've never seen before. Some of the stuff that actually have become uh, traditional are no longer as high quality as they were before. So like some of like the veins of like the Calcutta gold are different. I think the synthetics have actually come an unbelievable distance. And even the concrete countertops have now become a lot less maintenance intensive than the ones that I installed. And again, it just, it gives you, it, you, you have this whole palette of, of these wonderful materials and this is where the designers get to go ahead and work with them to create these great spaces for their individual clients. So what questions do you have for my guests? Waterfall countertops, here to stay or moving on? I think here to stay, yeah. Couple of thumbs up from me, yeah. Why? Yeah, just, but, what, 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 who, who invented the waterfall and why is it here to stay? Can you it explain what that is, John? <laughs> I'm going to show a picture. Okay. Yeah, you can see on that blue kitchen again, two waterfall countertops, both in the wood. Actually, one of my one of my jokes under some of these kitchens is John had mentioned about landing a uh, airplane on an island. We mm -hmm. all have to remember that that uh, like Australia is also an island. It happens to be a countertop. I'm uh, sorry, it happens to also be a country, a, a uh, continent. And some of these things, like the waterfalls, some of these waterfalls become like Niagara. I mean, they're just so big and huge. Yeah, so this is a waterfall where you've continued the wood yep. countertop over the edge to the floor. What you and actually don't see in that, in that image, on the end of that countertop, in the side of that, I'm not sure if there is, no, there's no image there you can click on. You can just barely see it. Um, I've buried a hidden fridge in the side of that um, waterfall countertop as well, which we... Yeah. There's another waterfall, right? Yeah, those are waterfalls as well. It's, yeah, it's where the, the, the flat surface of the countertop drops to the floor, it's either in stone or in the wood. And I've done it in both materials as well, where we've dropped the stone to the floor and then dropped the wood to the floor so that both two pieces are talking to each other. I think it's a lovely design element, and it goes equally as well with a classic transitional kitchen as it does with a modern kitchen. Almost 
exclusively the more modern stuff that we do will have a waterfall like this one this is about as modern as we go we call it our soft modern right soft modern so it's got a modern blend but it's got softer tones to it uh, it's an overlay kitchen so this is a, a simple presentation compared to some of our more complex insect cabinetry but the concept is the same if you waterfall countertop is without a doubt here to stay i i love designing it and i design these things for my clients so you know, as long as I'm designing, I'm these designing waterfall countertops. You Not said, every time, but a lot of the time. You said inset cabinetry. That's a fascinating thing for me. Uh, talk to me about the inset versus overlaid doors in cabinetry. A New Canaan, a well-known New Canaan designer that Scott works with all the time, uh, told me that um, that inset doors are sort of um are done in this area and uh like fairfield county they love their inset doors overlay doors a cleaner look is uh much more done throughout the rest of the country so talk to me about trends on overlay doors and inset doors uh we've seen a, a, a small trend away from absolute traditional which is the exposed hinges on a inset cabinet i think mm -hmm. the cabinetry behind you is inset cabinetry but it's probably got concealed hinges on the inside of the doors so that's yeah. a slightly cleaner look um, we've also modularized slightly from our original designs going back into 20s 2006 and 2007 which were very in inverted comms traditional we've now come to a transitional and then to create because the market was asking us for something more modern we, we created soft modern so soft modern was the European styling, but still with a hint of softness and how Bakes wanted to do it and how we wanted to do it. So there's been, certainly been that development, but I don't think there's ever going to be a time when insect cabinetry is going to be out of fashion completely. I, th I think that's wrong. I, I think it's always going to be. It's going to be perhaps a bit more modular. It may have sharper hardware on it. I mean, sharper by more linear a little bit more um transitional or modern for the hardware pieces but it's absolutely going to exist for as long I, ha as I have a theory on that you want to hear it absolutely I, I, I have a theory i think ikea does overlay doors it's a very modern look and i think that the people in fairfield county say oh that's a manufactured look and overlay doors and an, an ikea overlay door that it may be modern but it's manufactured i want something more that communicates customness and i think that's why people in this area are opting for hidden hinge inset doors because let me just share one one image with you um one image on the it's called cliffside soft modern it's a it is the classic example. If you scroll down a little bit to the middle, down, 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 down a little bit more, I think. Um, yeah, keep on going a bit. Maybe we missed it. Maybe it needs to go back up again. Cliffside, huh? Cliffside Modern. It's, it's, it's one of the central pictures. I've got the website up as well. If you keep going. Keep Upside. going, keep going. Keep going. A lot of kitchens. Yeah, it's yeah, model. <laughs> yeah, we've done a few. <laughs> yeah, so this was the original concept behind when soft modern first came out about five or six years ago. Soft modern is a phrase that we coined. Um, I wanted to do modern, but I wanted to keep it organic. So we blended a high gloss finish, which is polyurethane high gloss, with the classic, the examples are high gloss and matte. And there'll be two different tones within the kitchen. So we're playing the high gloss as a statement piece, but we're bringing in a matte finish. And in this case, it was a matte walnut finish with some back panels, custom design hood, some open shelves. So it's got a feeling, is it inset? Is it overlay? Well, this is actually true overlay. It's actually got um, beveled handles on the, most of the doors. So you either don't see the hardware or the hardware's a finger pull on the top of the door. So we minimalize that as well. You can see that on one of the interior pictures. Next one. Hey, you, there's no hardware on the back wall. So this was the development, the first pitch I had. 
at how do I want my soft modern to look at? So this is going to be overlay cabinetry, so European styling. It is more modern transitional. You can certainly soften it just a little bit to give it a bit more flavor. And sometimes people think overlay cabinetry, yeah, yeah, it is IKEA, it is clinical. This is not clinical. I don't, I don't believe it's clinical. I, I think it's got warmth and I think it's got energy to it. And it's got some nice play pieces. And it's, it's certainly something that we're equally as excited about when we come and do our presentations and we're presenting our products and we can go from the classic to the soft modern uh, to the point in the last two major showroom renovations I've done, which is West Palm Beach in New York City. Um, one of the first displays you see right front and center as you walk into the showroom is the soft modern display because I believe it's going to be a huge player in what we're going to be doing in the future. How quickly can you go from design to installation? Um, and manufacturing time, because we're, we're a manufacturer as well. Bakes and Crop is a design company and a manufacturing company, all under the same umbrella, run by me, Bob Bakes, and my partner, Paul Crop. Paul Crop is mostly involved in the manufacturing, I'm involved in design and concept. And we can, I mean, we can go from a full set of design drawings. So if, if you said to me, right, this is, there's a set of drawings, this is exactly what I want. We will convert that to our drawings, It'll take about a week. We'll say, okay, if you want this thing in eight to 10 weeks, I can land it in eight to 10 weeks for you, fully custom. So we tried to, I mean, this is company speak, but we tried to develop a process which is, um, it's fast tracked, but it's not fast tracked at the expense of anything. It's just because that's what I want to do. I want to make sure we are no more than an eight to 10 week lead time, because that gives people something to really gravitate to. It helps in a number of ways. One of them being, right, obviously, if we can, if we can come and do a survey on one of Scott's buildings eight weeks before we're due to deliver the cabinetry, that building is that much further on. The windows are in, the, maybe not the sheet rock, some of the roughing. So the elements that contribute to the configuration of the space are that much more advanced by the time I need to get my final drawings done than perhaps some of our local competitors and definitely some of our European competitors. So lead time has always been a real big thing for me to keep it at that point. And I don't think it's ever extended, except maybe once in the, in the depths of COVID when we're all just struggling to know what was going to happen in the world. And where do you fabricate these items? We're made, made up in Detroit, just north of Detroit. Which is why you have now, I understand, the Michigan. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, how important is that. that as a differentiator? It occurs to me that Very I important. say... I can I can get Carrera marble anywhere, and there's a, a, you know kitchen di designers all over the place. But you just set, I think, a major point that I would think is really important to somebody like Scott, who might be building in New York, where he's got very specific windows and he's got to meet his dates. The fact that you design and make it, and you're working closely with somebody like Eric at Faithful Countertops, and can deliver it on time within the window, that's gotta be a major differentiator. Scott, do you find that that's one of the weak points of scheduling is getting those cabinets in on time? I, I mean, the, a kitchen is always critical path. More activity takes place in building in a kitchen than any other room inside of the house. And so you do have to get it all lined up. You do have to have the stuff come together. And it, it really, it's, you know, in this business, your reliability and your word is a big deal. So if you can do what you say you can do, people will will continue to go to you and will come back to you. When you claim to do something and then you don't come through, not surprisingly, people tend to uh, discount your uh, promises in the future. So Did yes, it is a big deal. Two new favorite vendors today. <laughs> well, I, I will say one of the trickiest parts in a in a in the high end custom residential is how much architects like to use talented designers. There's some architects that can design really nice kitchens and they like to do it. There's others that think they can do it, but can't. And sometimes they won't give up that control, which is something that ends up putting us toward a pure, a pure custom side of things. Um, so it, it matters. I mean, and I'm a huge fan of great design. And so people that know what they're doing add a lot of value for their client. And having the, uh, the, the full service is especially good 
if the architect's not top level. Um, and again, a lot of architects may think that they're good at designing kitchens, but they don't understand the detail at the level the kitchen specialists do. Yeah, I'm not obviously a big advocate of that statement. I've spent 30 years designing kitchens. So I think the depth of experience I have and my designers is we really do have something to offer across the board. Um, going back to something you were saying, Scott, about um, an architect who's a really good designer, and a really good kitchen designer as well, and has a very well-defined um, sense of what they want in terms of they've drawn something out. Um, if an architect like comes to us and says, Bob, I don't see this style on your website, um, can you do it? If it can be built physically in a factory, then we can build that too. Mm -hmm. doesn't overly affect lead time pressure because we're geared towards that lead time because we will have done all the pre-work ahead of getting it in front of the factory so as we can still give that eight to ten weeks on a completely custom door well a custom door is you go and get a new set of knives done a custom wood source you just source the wood but it's all about having the mindset that okay this is our template and this is how we present the bakes and crop product this is what it generally looks like but if you want something different continue to talk to us because we are completely custom I mean, the same thing applies with eric if he something if people don't see something on his website they're going to ask him i love what you do and i love the way you present but i wanted this particular piece like this glass um countertop can you do it of course he's going to say yeah because he's got the skill sets to be able to do it so you know we're, we're similar minded and that's why we work together so similar. what's going to what's going to change five years from now, 10 years from now, or you're, you're not going to be building the same things you're building now. What's going to be different? I think that there's going to be some product and design development, but from my perspective, I've been doing the white kitchen with a twist mm -hmm. since 2006. We do as much of that now as we used to do in 2006. Obviously, the company was growing in size. And it's still just as relevant today as it was back in 2006. We've all got an awful lot more in our, in our toolbox that we can now offer our clients so we can offer them a wider spread. I think we may see, I mean, we develop our signature series and colors um, because people ask us, can you take this color up, down, left or right? Can you do this stain slightly differently? Can you make that ceruzing much more heavier like the old pickling? It goes back into the days of the UK in the 70s and 80s when small bones was doing pickled oak and they were really blowing it out um, or some flaming sycamore and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of directions that we could go in, but I sort of stay in those tram lines of developing the visual image. You can have any color as you want, as long as it's white or gray. I mean, it's and we're working gray. with walnut and or oak. No, he's got a blue. There's a blue in there. A oh, and a blue as well he yeah. snuck in a blue and everybody got nervous <laughs> now we actually flip around that saying the other way i say this is this is what we do and that's the website but we can do anything you want so all right i want to i want to come to your final thoughts but before i do i want to just remind everybody you can find burrows and burbs on apple spotify and most and all of these places so youtube is where you can find it in about an hour uh the recording of this show i want to grace thank farms. our sponsor grace farms uh that's them in new canaan we love grace farms and they've got their big gala coming up so make sure you uh, check out gracefarms.org and look into the gala and lisa i'm going to turn it over to you for what did you learn today? Yep, you're on you're on mute. There you go. What did I learn today that I haven't yeah, you learn? known from these two? No, they're the top in the industry. And I feel like not only are they knowledgeable, they're so easy to work with. And if you work with either Eric or Bob, you know, like you don't have to worry. You're gonna have a luxury, unbelievable kitchen, and it is there's not going to be no issues and they care. They really care that their client is happy and they're passionate. So as much as it means to the client, it means it's very important that they do the best job. Oh, Roberto, how about you? 
for real it's it's it the kitchen really does make the home and it's such an important decision that it's really important to get really to find someone who really specializes in that space the nuances of what happens in there and you know and that's just you know that's what that's the conclusion really next week we're doing the show with night frank in dubai so i'm wondering bob eric can you help out our friends in Dubai, maybe with a new kitchen, some countertops, or is that a bridge too far? If somebody asked me really nicely, I'll go anywhere in the world. <laughs> All right. I love it. International. Here we come. Totally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, for inspiring this show. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Really beautiful website. Really beautiful uh, countertops and designs. I mean, it looks like it's of the highest quality. And clearly, Bob, you've been at this quite some time and come from what can I, dare I say, royal pedigree with the small bones, <laughs> uh, the small bones start and have really taken that to the next level. Uh, really awesome stuff. So thank you so much for thank this hour. I learned a lot about kitchens and the trends. Gray is the new white, and you can have oak, and you can have walnut, but uh, and you can have blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye.